For thousands of years, the Aboriginals have passed down dreamtime stories about the unique Australian animals that had evolved in this ancient country, known as the Land of the Never Never. Since European settlement and the introduction of feral animals, many native creatures have become endangered, and much of the flora and fauna the Aboriginals so loved has become threatened. Some of the introduced animals have reverted to their ancient forms, becoming vicious and dangerous predators. In 1998, an Aboriginal elder working on an outback sheep station was attacked and nearly killed by a wild boar. The enraged savage beast killed both his sheepdogs and then turned on the old man. This is the true story about David Ivan's quest to hunt down the wild boar responsible for the vicious attack on the old man. David has had a long association with Australian Aboriginals and has learned much from the knowledge they have of native animals. David has devoted most of his life filming wild animals. His wildlife photography is legendary. David Island is renowned for risking his life to record the behavior of often extremely dangerous creatures. David has been asked to help a friend with a feral pig problem on a Queensland sheep station. His long journey begins by crossing the Great Dividing Range, but he can't resist spending a few days exploring these ancient mountains before he ventures onto the outback plains. This is the Great Dividing Range. It separates the east coast from the outback. Three million years ago, this whole mountain range was covered by an inland sea. Then geological forces pushed up the Earth's crust and the sea drained away. Over time, rivers, wind and rain then carved and sculptured the magic country that we see here now. What excites me is that some of the pristine wilderness that the Aboriginals enjoyed for thousands of years still exists. And many of the creatures and animals that evolved in these mountains still survive. When the Aboriginals first entered these mountains, they encountered huge snakes. Pythons had long before evolved in Australia to prey on warm-blooded mammals. Oh, look at this! What we have here is a, an absolutely beautiful specimen of a carpet python. What makes this such fantastic python country is up behind me is old growth forest. Plenty of old dead trees and logs and, and holes for, for warm blooded animals, possums and birds. All great python tucker. These pythons are a bit unpredictable. They don't have venom glands but they do have over a hundred very sharp teeth in these jaws and they all face backwards. And a bite from a python this size would be very painful. You beautiful animal. <laughs> a python. Off you go, mate. I'm sorry for the interruption.
this python has just caught himself a common rat. These rats have infested the Australian bush. They cause a lot of trouble killing native birds. And this python has just thrown a coil around this rat. What happens is when the rat takes a breath, when it exhales, the, the python increases the pressure and literally suffocates the rat. And now what the animal's doing now is, is making sure that the rat is dead and then he will force his jaw bones apart and swallow it. To explore the more remote, untouched and unchanged country, canoeing is required. There's no greater pleasure for lovers of nature than to experience truly pristine wilderness. Australia has some of the most deadly and toxic snakes in the world. Only people with experience should handle the potentially lethal serpents. A strike in this remote wilderness could well prove fatal. This is great tiger country. And what we have here is a magnificent specimen of a tiger snake. These tiger snakes vary in colour from black to silver grey like this one. Tiger snakes, their venom is highly toxic to man. And if untreated, it can well be fatal. Tiger snakes like to normally strike sideways very fast. But they strike low down. A good reason to wear boots in the bush. But the beauty about these snakes is they like to warn before they strike. And they do that by flattening their body. They often give a loud hiss and sometimes even make a, a cuff noise, quite loud. These are magnificent predators. And this is one big specimen of a tiger. That is the Australian tiger snake a wonderful Australian predator. This is the absolute master of camouflage and ambush. This snake is one of the fastest striking snakes in Australia and their fangs are long enough to penetrate right through my boots. This is the death adder. What an amazing creature. In fact, this would have to be the biggest death adder I've ever seen. What's fascinating about these creatures is not only their ability to, to hide in leaf litter, but the tail. And if we look at the end of the tail, it's just like a worm. They wiggle that around and when a carnivorous mouse or bird comes down to investigate, the death adder strikes very fast and they immobilize their prey. This is the death adder, an amazing creature, an absolute master of camouflage. On the high ridges, the soil becomes drier and more arid. And found here are arguably the most dangerous snakes on the planet. David is well aware that this incredibly toxic snake has reflexes far quicker than his. But from years of experience, 
he's learned how to interact with dangerous animals without them becoming alarmed. I am being so gentle with this animal. And I am so cautious. I mean, this is the fear snake. He is the most toxic, venomous snake in the world. And what a magnificent creature. And what a magnificent predator. The inland taipan. You go your way, mate, and I'll go mine. White explorers sadly lack knowledge of how to find life-sustaining food in the forbidding mountains and valleys of the Great Dividing Range. In the old days, many of these swamps and creeks and rivers were well stocked with freshwater crayfish. And they still are today. Oh, look at this. The Aboriginals used to cook them straight on the hot coals. But I have a better way of cooking them. So we're going to have some bush tucker. Those early explorers would have found life a lot more bearable in the Australian bush if they tapped into the knowledge of the Australian Aboriginal. These freshwater crayfish, these yabbies are high in protein and I can tell you they're absolutely delicious. Country pubs are well known for their hospitality, great country and western music, and especially their cold beer. In the land of the dreaming, there's a story of old love and old man's knowledge of God's ancient creatures, a lifetime of secrets that's never been told. David's mission to help his friend takes him into the outback of New South Wales. These western plains are experiencing the worst drought in living memory. Native animals are attracted to the edges of the road to feed on the only remaining grasses. At night, kangaroos are blinded by car and truck lights. Thousands are killed. This is a little red kangaroo. She's been She's been struck by a truck or a car during the night. Hundreds of kangaroos are killed this way on the Australian roads. The sad thing about this one... Yeah. 
Inside the pouch is a little red kangaroo joey. This poor little guy is very, very young. He still, his eyes still haven't opened. And the sad thing about this kangaroo is these, these big red kangaroos, they grow to over two meters high, over six feet tall. And there's nothing better than seeing a big red kangaroo just bounding across the outback plains. We'll do all we can for this guy, but without his mother and being so young, I don't like his chances of survival. Sheep stations in outback New South Wales and Queensland have suffered huge stock losses over the last 50 years from droughts. Many families have simply walked away from their homesteads to find work in the cities. Scott, this, uh, this drought that we're, we're experiencing out here now, would this be one of the worst you've seen? Without a doubt, David, yeah, it's de definitely the worst. Scott's I can remember. family property is also suffering under the effects of the drought. Scott is gravely concerned about the future of his stock as predator feral pigs are compounding their problems by attacking and killing large numbers of his sheep. What's happened here is the, the drought conditions are so severe that many of the larger wild boars are, are turning 100% carnivorous. This ewe was lay down and given birth to, to twins and the old boar's come along and he's ripped her up, he's eaten part of her and then he's killed both these little lambs and he's eaten half the carcass of each. It's not hard to understand why property owners like Scott are so unhappy with the large populations of, of wild pigs on their properties. Property owners combat the dry, arid conditions by sinking bores deep into the earth and tapping into the underground artesian water. This water then flows into man-made drains. The bore drains supply water for stock and native animals. Unfortunately, the abundance of fresh water also allows feral introduced animals to thrive. What we've got here is a mob of feral goats. They cause a lot of trouble in the outback. There are thousands of them in New South Wales and in Queensland. The problem is they compete for food for many of our native animals, especially wallabies. Some of our native animals are now endangered because of these feral animals. I'd say what's happened here is the, the mother of these twin goats has probably died from the drought. You can see the unbiblical cord is still, still very much there. These guys have only been probably born yesterday. Twin little feral goats. These um, goats cause a lot of trouble in the outback because they, they crop and they browse a great deal of food that the native animals feed on. And they do cause a lot of damage and some of our native animals are now endangered because of feral goats. But these two little twins, they'd have no chance of surviving now without their mother. So rather than leave them here. We'll take them back to the property and they can rear them and keep them as pets. They're quite beautiful, aren't they? Many property owners combat the pig problem with traps, but unfortunately many pigs become wary and will not enter the traps. In the heavy lignum scrub that lines the bore drains, shooting has limited success as the pigs are hard to see. 
the use of catch dogs and a knife has proved the most successful method of culling pigs. It's now time for David to roll up his sleeves and get stuck into the dangerous job of culling feral pigs. Once pigs are flushed from the lick, the chase is on. Once the catch dog, Blue, takes hold of the pig, the men must subdue the animal as quickly as possible. The longer the dog holds the pig, the more chance he'll be ripped by the boar's tusks. It's an amazing experience to wrestle an animal like this to the ground with your bare hands and to know that if this wild animal gets up, it could potentially kill you. I can tell you that the adrenaline just flows through your arms. Each pig caught is culled quickly with a knife. This method of culling is far quicker than poison baits or poorly placed bullets from a bucking helicopter. However, for a wildlife cameraman, the work is far from enjoyable. This is quite a big boar. How big? Huh? Oh, it'd be 50, I'd say. He's very strong. Got a good set of tusks. The lack of rain has depleted the paddocks of feed. Many weak and undernourished sheep become bogged when seeking water. They simply don't have the strength to save themselves. I'm drag this poor sheep out. There. Up you get. Come on. Up you get. There. Goannas often raid farmers' poultry, and chicken and eggs are easy prey for these powerful predators. Goannas also prey upon feral rabbits, swallowing the pests with relative ease. David enjoys nothing more than an encounter with a goanna, although these ancient Australian monitors are highly dangerous. And there's nothing more fun than to try and catch a goanna. <laughs> Look at him. He's just under the tree there. Now the wind, unfortunately, is behind me, and he can see me and smell me. He's thinking about what to do. 
sneak around here. Hello. How are you going? <laughs> Hello. What are you going to do? He's standing his ground, this bloke. I might just take my hat off. So if he has a go at me, he can eat my hat first. Which will give me a chance to run. <laughs> Hello. Hello, are you a cranky one or not? You're standing your ground, aren't you, mate? Here we go. And we're off. And we're off. Up the tree we go, but not quick enough. Not quick enough for the old croc. <laughs> Look at you. How you going, partner? How you going? Let's just see if we can get up this tree. Here we go. And I've got you. No. Oh, don't be like that. No. Don't hiss. It's all right, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just saying hello. Oh, he's very, he's very unhappy. They eat insects when they're little, but one this size, he can even eat small mammals. And there's nothing more fun than being up a tree in the outback with your goanna. <laughs> Yeah, look at him, isn't he beautiful? All right, I'll let him go. You ready? Off he goes. <laughs> look at you. I've got myself a really nice goanna. And I've got him. These guys are very powerful animals. Got a long tail, they use their tail as a weapon. They can whip it like a whip. And they've got incredibly sharp talons. Very, very sharp talons. They use the talons for climbing up trees and ripping open the nests of snakes and birds and other lizards. And in their jaws are very sharp little teeth. He is very upset at me. The only reason he can't bite my hand is this stick here is stopping the head coming round and getting my hand. He's flattening his body to make himself look bigger. Perfect Aussie predator. I'm gonna let him go and let him go up the tree. Watch him go. Off you go. <laughs> Scott's property has only one billabong. David's concerned feral pigs will destroy its fragile banks. While Scott continues to cull pigs working the board drains, David decides to hunt pigs living around the vulnerable billabong. There's numerous ways of culling down the wild boar out here in the outback. A high-powered rifle is without any doubt the most humane way to cull down a boar. The only problem is a loud, high-powered rifle. You shoot one boar and the rest scatter in all directions. Working a billabong like this, where we're trying to cull out maybe three or four wild pigs working the spot, a bow can be a very useful tool. They're very, very quiet and very deadly, but they require months and months of practice to get a good, quick kill. So it's not an easy weapon to use. But we're gonna use it today. Okay, well, that arrow is well placed. The main thing with bow hunting is that you have to get very close so that the arrow kills the animal quickly. It's broken off in the chest. Bow hunting pigs 
is a very effective way of culling pigs. And if it's shot at close range and you've done your practice, then the animal dies very quickly, almost as fast as a high powered rifle. It's the only way to kill animals, if you have to kill them at all. Okay. Some of Australia's unique creatures are now threatened with extinction because of the introduction of feral pests. Feral cats have also taken up residence around the billabong. There's only one course of action. These creatures, there's millions of them in the bush, and they're an incredible predator. Intelligent, great vision, great hearing, great sense of smell, quick, very, very good teeth, of course, and they can climb. And this animal is responsible for killing incredible numbers of our birds and our lizards. They're an absolute major pest in the bush. And I don't really know What's going to happen to Australia if we, if we don't find a way of eliminating these rotten things from the bush? They're bloody terrible. <laughs> We're following a, a male, an emu, along at about 20 k's an hour, nice and slow. <laughs> He's just trotting along across this, this open red, red plain. It's absolutely wonderful. Have a look at the guy, it looks like he's, he's just bouncing along real quiet. Hearing David is in the local area, the Aboriginal school at Kaduga invites him to talk to the children about his many years filming wild animals. Thank you. And we actually got footage filming straight up the tusks of this huge bull elephant right there. If I stood up in the truck, I could have touched its tusk. I had a big knife strapped to my chest for cutting ropes because sometimes the crocodiles would try and pull the cage over. And all of a sudden we heard this big growl and big commotion and the lioness had hold of a wildebeest and she had hold of it by the muzzle, like that. Oh, that but it's a good story, isn't it? <laughs> David has devoted many years educating children about the wilderness and its creatures. He strongly believes the only hope that animals will survive into the future is with education of the young. Scott has enlisted two local boys as spotters. Jamie and Stephen will use their keen eyes to find boars in the lignum grasses. It's not long before more dangerous pigs are located. <laughs> Get, Get out, Frank. The important thing, the important thing here is when you go in for the grab, to grab the back legs, as you see the, the ball can spin around, drag the dog with it and still grab hold of you. 
and then when you flip it, the man that drives his knee in behind the head, again if the dog lets go too quick, those jaws wrap around the man's arm or around his leg. Okay, this is uh, a sow. People don't realise that even the even the sows are quite dangerous. She can have up to uh, two litters a year, so they breed like crazy. Absolute menace. Even sows are dangerous beasts. Their powerful jaws can easily crush bones, and their short, sharp tusks can inflict a hemorrhaging wound on man or dog. He's charging the dog. David must be quick to drive his knee behind the lethal head before the animal can use its shocking jaws. David is a conservationist, but also a realist. He fully realises the need to cull pigs, but worries the most widely used methods of baiting are cruel. They're all promoting 1080. Yeah. But this bloody 1080, it's a cruel way to die, isn't it? It is. It is. Because it, it basically burns their guts out, doesn't it? That's right, yeah. How long does it take for a pig to die from 1080? Oh, it could take anything from half an hour up to a day. Up to a day? Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, it doesn't compare with four or five seconds of a knife, does it, really? No, no, it's, no there's no comparison. David is concerned that local Aboriginal children may be at great risk from a boar attack when they fish the drains for yabbies. His worst fears are realised when he meets a local Aboriginal elder by the name of Tiger. One dog come out run out and looked up at me nephew, might just say I'm dying. Yeah. And, and he picked him up and had him in his arms. Yeah. And then the other one ran out and laid near the tree and it died. And then the other one come out all ripped up. So I, my brother said, well, Tiger, we'll have to get him now. He killed our dogs. So we went back to the car and I got the gun. Yeah. So I walked around the other side of the lignum bush Trying to find him. Trying to find him, and I spotted him laying in this bush. Yeah. So I put the gun up, but I was too close. The, the scope was all blurry. I couldn't see him properly. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, he just come rushing straight out. And he charged you. Yeah, charged me. Right. And uh, so I pulled the trigger. And I don't know if I hit him or not, but I bowled it for a tree. Yeah. And before I got to the tree, he hit me up the bum. And then. I rolled over, I thought he hit me and kept going, but as I rolled over, I spotted him coming back again. Right. Then he hit me again up there, he tore me trousers like if I had a skirt on, I had my shorts on. So he hit you twice in your legs? Yeah. Didn't he? And then I rolled over again, as I looked back again, he was coming at me again, he would have got me up in the throat here. I threw this up here and he got me in here, you see. So what, the tusk went in there? Yeah, the tusk went in, that was big open up wide, I had all that end in there trying to stop it from bleeding. Right, right. And the white froth was just coming out of his mouth, you know, all over the tusk. I was laying on my back. Yeah, but where Spre was he then? He was sort of hitting me and going back and coming again. And I was just laying there screaming, every time he'd come I'd shut my eyes and kick and I kept kicking him under the brisket, yeah. keeping him off and he got me in the foot a couple of times. I thought I was going to die because if he'd got me in the stomach or up the, in the groin somewhere, yeah. he would have killed me. Where was your brother? 
he was up the tree. So he was too scared to he come down. He was too scared to come down. I was screaming at him to come down and help me. Yeah. But he was too scared. If he'd have came down out of the tree and snorted, the pig would have chased him and would have given me time to get away. And he said, by the Jesus, man, he said, you got a gash in you like this. Yeah. So I put my hand around there and my hand went straight in it. Right. And what about your arm? Yeah, well, it did be just pumping blood out this. He nearly killed me. I was in there for five and a half weeks in the hospital. You still think this pig's alive? Yeah, I think he's still down there. A decision is made to work the area closer to where Tiger was attacked. If the old Razorback is still alive, he'll have learned to stay away from the open paddocks and keep to the timber country. The day begins with a life-threatening encounter. A huge tusk boar is flushed from the lignum grass. As Scott and Blue try to hold the extremely powerful beast, David goes in. The action is incredibly dangerous. This is one really big boar that uh, walk along the side of the river and it, having trouble holding him down. This is one very big pig. God, look at the hooks on this black. Look at that. Mate, this black, he'd tear you to pieces, wouldn't he? Yeah. Can you imagine what it was like for Tiger to be looking down jaws like that while it's ripping into his arm? Unbelievable. Look at that. Good God. What a monster. Even though this boar is more than capable of killing a man, it's not old enough to be the one that attacked Tiger. The search for Tiger's boar must continue. Now the chase is on again. Blue has bailed up a heavy-shouldered razorback. This pig is different. He shows absolutely no fear of Blue or the men. The boar's tusks have torn Blue's gums. The hunt must be called off immediately. Blue's mouth is torn, but thankfully not badly. David believes the pig they encountered is too dangerous to hunt with dogs. He'll try and track the animal down with a high-powered rifle. Tracking animals successfully requires years of experience. David has used his tracking ability many times to film animals. Today, he has no choice but to swap his camera for a rifle. We got him. We got him. Okay. He's a nice big boar. He's a big pig. A real big pig. Well, just check out this bloke. This may well be the boar that attacked Tiger. The first thing to look at here is he meets the description. He's about the, the 80 kilo size. He's the same colour. And Tiger talked about its ears being really ripped up from other dogs. It killed numerous dogs. And if you look at the ears on this boar, they're all torn up, both of them. See that? He's also got dog-killer tusks. They're not huge, 
but they're certainly big enough to kill a dog and rip up a man. And this may well be the pig that attacked Tiger, the one that we are so concerned about with kids fishing the boar drain. You can't help but feel sorry for them, but he just doesn't belong out here. It's just too bloody dangerous. You rest in peace, old mate. Told. His eyes 